My message title today is Easter as Teacher. And uh, unity has a rather interesting lens that it sees through in terms of Easter. It does include a depiction of the outer circumstance 2,000 and some years ago of Jesus, of the victory over death, and that in the unity teachings the focus is not so much on crucifixion, it is the resurrection. And the resurrection is, in my heart of hearts, actually happened, but it's also a metaphor. Because there is this premise, as within, so without, as above, so below. So there is this felt knowing that outer occurrences that we celebrate today and many others, Christmas and lots of different holidays, are metaphors of an inner event, an inner process that is your process, not just a select few or an individual that was a way shower of a great and powerful presence in life, but of your life. And that's what awakening produces in us is a felt knowing and an awareness and a self-realization that the great teachers of the planet, both past and present and future, are pointing us towards something. And that is our own resurrection, our own regeneration, our own renewal. That when we find ourselves in the tomb of limitation as a result of a crucifixion in our own life experience that hurts us, that we feel bruised and banished from friends or work or whatever. There is this promise that that stone of limitation will be removed and the indwelling presence and power and strength of God, Spirit, will come forth and will rise. This is the intimacy of this message today. The intimacy that you have within you. The same identity that was so powerfully demonstrated through this individual personage that was and is a master of self. So oftentimes in this life experience when we think of, of Jesus, we may have our baggage around that. But also, part of that baggage is that that was an exclusive event. Only one has done that. Only one Son of God. Only one was able to do that. And that vicariously we are saved by his demonstration. Well, the unity teachings point to something I feel much more enlivening. Paul, who has mixed reviews, <laughs> in terms of telling us how we should live, well, even that is an interpretation of a man that had a tremendous experience. He was dead set against killing people that were part of the way. They weren't even called Christians yet. 
They were just following a way of life. And it was contrary to his upbringing and teaching as a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. So he wanted to do away with them. But this presence and power overshadowed him and changed his life, changed his way of seeing completely. That same presence and power is here with us today. That if we have been perceiving life in a way that has been destructive, that that can be changed. Unity is an educational teaching. I have always considered myself to be a spiritual educator. And an educator is someone that brings forth something from someone else and from my own life. I'm not here to tell you how to live. You're well beyond that, right? You don't need that anymore, how to live. But we do desire to live joyously and powerfully connected with this one life. I know that that is true. And we sometimes get into this tomb of perception, closed off from this sense of connection with each other and, and with this source of oneness that is our birthright. For we are not flung into this life just to live unconsciously in a pattern of suffering, looking for meaning and fruition through others. Our relationships are relatively very important. But what is the core of it? At the very core of the center of the labyrinth of self is that light that is our heritage. It is our heritage. And my increasingly What occurs within my own soul is to go deeper into that place. Because the world is so filled with a lack of meaning until it is charged with this presence and power. And we seek meaning through so many ways until we grow dissatisfied with, and it's a divine dissatisfaction. It's all part of this unfoldment that we are heading into, into the center of ourselves, into the center of our being. I'd like to illustrate that today with you by a book that I've just recently come across that my wife and I have been reading every morning together. It's called The Universal Christ by a man named Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest. And the line of the Franciscan order, starting with Francis of Assisi is very powerful. It seeks for the, different, the, the deeper knowing, the deeper understanding, the mystery of it all, the mystery of you, the mystery of our oneness with this thing called Christ. And part of the healing that I would like to bring about today and, and really every Sunday is my intention that this Christ energy is not just solely about Jesus. He was a conduit for it. 
He was the master of himself and he had prepared himself to be a voice for it. But guess what? You are also, can be, a conduit for it. Because it is said that God is no respecter of persons. What does that mean? God, spirit, respects and loves all of creation and no aspect of it is more special than the next. So that means that you and I are part of a universal oneness. We are part of a universal oneness that is called in spirituality, in the Western tradition. It is called Christ. But I would like to share with you an experience by a woman who had an an opening to this universalness that I'm sharing with you today. This woman is a traditionally a Catholic, but her experience goes beyond religiosity. Her name is Carol Hauslander, and she says, I was in an underground train, a crowded train in which all sorts of people jostled together, sitting and strap hanging, workers of every description going home at the end of the day. And quite suddenly, I saw within a wonderful picture, Christ in them all. But I saw more than that. Not only was Christ in every one of them, living in them, dying in them, rejoicing in them, sorrowing in them, but because Christ was in them and because they were here, the whole world was here too. Here in this underground train, not only the world as it was in that moment, not only all the people in all the countries of the world, but all those people who have lived in the past and all those yet to come. I came out into the street and walked for a long time in the crowds, and it was the same here on every side, in every passerby, everywhere, Christ. I saw, too, the reverence that everyone must have for people. Instead of seeing error, which is in reality sorrow, one must comfort Christ in all people. And this reverence must be seen in all souls who seem to be dead because it is Christ who is the life of the soul. Now I would like to just reiterate that this isn't just about seeing Jesus in them. Her experience may have been very well that. But once again, this book is called The Universal Christ. Christ is everywhere. In him, every kind of life has a meaning and has an influence of every other kind of life. Realization of our oneness in Christ is the only cure for human loneliness. For me too, it is the only ultimate meaning of life, the only thing that gives meaning and purpose to every life. And Richard Rohr offers also some input in his book. He says the question for me and for us is, who is this Christ that Carol Hauslander saw permeating and radiating from all her fellow passengers. Christ for her was clearly not just Jesus of Nazareth, but something much more immense, even cosmic in significance. My point is this, when I know that the world around me is both the hiding place and the revelation of God, I can no longer make a significant distinction between the natural and the supernatural 
between the holy and the profane. Everything I see and know is indeed one universe revolving around one coherent center, the divine presence, seeks connection and communion, not separation or division, except for the sake of an even, even deeper future union. The subtitle of this book is How a Forgotten Reality Can Change Everything We See, Hope For, and Believe. And I would like to reframe that subtitle, taking just a little license today, that it's not about a forgotten reality. It's about remembering reality. Remembering what it is that is true behind the appearances. Just as Carol Hauslander had this experience, what resided behind the appearances in the train, on the street, where everyone was seemingly walking along in their own lives in this compartmentalized separation, looking for meaning, looking for purpose, looking for love, that just behind that is this presence and power. It is, if I could surmise the spiritual path, and I'm, I'm doing it in a simplistic way, but if I could surmise the spiritual path, it would be moving from forgetting to remembering. And everything else, all the books that we read, all the seminars that we go to, all the Sunday mornings that we attend, all the special nutrients that we eat, or whatever it is that drives us towards health. What that urge within us is to have that experience like this woman did on the train. To recognize our essential oneness and that that is the message of Easter. That which we call resurrection, that which we call regeneration or renewal is a movement in consciousness going from forgetting to remembering. And that you and I as students of truth are in this process also. I was talking with somebody just not too long ago and they said, you know, I've just been going through this process of forgetting who I am. But now I'm back. I'm back, not necessarily just because they came here, but they're back to themselves. They're back to a place of remembering the light within who they are. So this is beyond religion. This is beyond dogmatic belief systems. This is about discovering that inner flame within you. You know, in the book of John, the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter, 12th verse, this is my favorite verse in the Bible. It says, truly I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, greater than these will he do, because I go to the Father. 
There was a lot of hubbub in, in, uh, when I was looking for this scripture by biblical scholars. They, had a lot, they have a lot of trouble with this scripture. And they kind of wrestle with it because it's just like, well, how can anybody think that they're beyond Jesus? Well, my response is that this is not about competition. This is not about a hierarchy where Jesus is up here and we're down here. It has, this has nothing to do with that. This has everything to do with the fact that he entered into this divine flow. And that when we allow ourselves to move into that divine flow, there, there are demonstrations that can happen. Great demonstrations of healing, of health, of improvement, of forgiveness, and so forth. The words are pointing to a capacity within you and I. You know, in the I always have a little hesitancy about talking about the Bible. <laughs> Because I can see, I can see sometimes people in the audience kind of like drifting off. <laughs> the voice in the head that says, been there, done that. I'm not trying to convert you. <laughs> You're beyond that, are you not? You are awake, and I respect that. I bow to that in you. You are awake. You don't want to be bamboozled by biblical interpretation that, that is disrespectful to your life. And I'm not here to enforce or reinforce any kind of biblical teaching that doesn't point to the actual truth of being that you are. That the truth of being that you are is the resurrecting power within you that can help you to overcome any situation or circumstance. If we tap into this divine love this resurrecting, resurrecting Christ energy, it can dispel any, anything that we're going through. And I have seen it with so many people, and I have seen it in my own life experience. When I've gone through the valley of the shadow of death, in consciousness, feeling cut off, feeling separate from God, I remember one time in 1978, I had a small apartment in Burlingame, California. I was still in the Coast Guard and it was midnight. And I got up out of bed and I went and opened up the sliding glass window. And I just stood there and I just said, God, where are you? You ever been there? Where are you, God? That our senses just feel so heavy and so so closed in around truth. But that was, as I review it now, all meant to be because it forced me to go deeper and deeper and deeper inside to discover the light, to discover the truth of who, who I am. Remember that. All of your shadowy experiences are all part of a curriculum that the Spirit has for you to wake up. We haven't done anything wrong. So often we think we're, we've done something wrong. There's nothing wrong. There is just the path of awakening, the path of love.
If you look, people naturally bring flowers on Easter. Aren't these beautiful? Yeah. Marilyn. Dorothea. Who else brought flowers today? I'm sorry if I forget. Anyway, an act of love. So, Easter is an observance externally of Jesus overcoming death. But internally, like I said, it's a metaphor for the overcoming of our own death. Not at the end of our life, but the overcoming of the dead thoughts that we have about ourselves and about life itself. When we accept this power and presence within us, we live again. We rise out of the tomb. It is our natural state, our natural state of love. Thank you and happy Easter.